Sarah Martin is an associate professor in the Department of Political Science at Memorial University of Newfoundland and Labrador. She is a political economist specializing in the global political economy of food and agriculture. Her past research has explored food sovereignty movements, the political economy of food service corporations, and the interaction between finance and agriculture. She is currently researching the dynamics of food, feed, and fuel in relation to agri-aquacultures. And recently she co-edited co a book called Green Meat, Sustaining Animals, People, and the Planet. Uh, Sarah, uh, please go ahead with your presentation. Uh, thanks so much, Kathy. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm speaking to you from the homelands of the Bayatuk on the island of Newfoundland, which is the ancestral homelands of the Mi'kmaq and the Bayatuk. I would also like to recognize the Inuit of Natasabit and Nanutu Kavut and the Inu of Natasinan and their ancestors as the original people of Labrador. We strive for respectful relationships with all the peoples of this province as we search for collective healing and true reconciliation and honor this beautiful land together. Thank you so much for the invitation to be here. Thanks to Kathy and the entire NFU team uh, for all the important work that they undertake. I'm most grateful and I'm really quite honored to be speaking with you today. Um, a few caveats uh, before I launch into the talk. Um, first, I'm not an expert in Russia or Ukraine. I'm not an expert in security, peace or conflict. Um, I examine and research the global political economy of food and agriculture with a particular interest in infrastructures and how agricultural markets come into being. Um, I also want to be clear that all military adventurism must be condemned. Um, and militarism more generally is a widespread and destructive force and a clear threat to everyone's well-being in a myriad of ways and especially to agriculture. So in short, militarism in all its forms should be condemned. Uh, the UN human rights experts have called for the Russian Federation to immediately end uh, its invasion of Ukraine to, uh, to avoid further bloodshed and loss of life. War and conflict contribute to human suffering, climate change and environmental damage. So what am I going to talk about today? I'm going to put the Russian invasion into the context of agricultural infrastructures and some of the dynamics that are shaping the global food system and commodity markets. Uh, this talk actually started out with, with a tw Twitter thread, uh, which I'm building on here. I will first talk about infrastructures and then turn to the Ukrainian context. I will then examine how energy and agricultural markets are linked through global commodity markets. I'm then going to talk about uh, food insecurity and infrastructures. Uh, I'll then turn to the environmental impacts of conflict, specifically around agriculture. And finally, I'm going to turn to some of the possible uh, actions that we can look to. So first, a little bit about infrastructures. Agriculture supports life at multiple scales, and it requires an infrastructure. Forms such as militarism, such as the Russian invasion of Ukraine, operate to end life, and it targets directly and indirectly agricultural infrastructures, which actually support life. So when I talk about infrastructure, what am I talking about? So the Oxford English Dictionary um, defines it as a collective term for the subordinate parts of an undertaking, a substructure, a foundation. The word infrastructure uh, actually emerged in the 19th century and descri described the substrate of railways. So if you think about the bridges, the tunnels, the foundation that they act the railways actually traveled on, this is all required before railways could run. In other words, the infrastructure was required before railways could run. And these projects were usually connected to big nation building projects. We can think of the Canadian context here with the national project to build railways. 
One way to think about infrastructures is what is required to uphold an economy? What is required to uphold an agricultural economy? And different kinds of infrastructures uphold different kinds of economies. As Winona LeDuc and Deborah Cowan have said, a pipeline can transport fossil fuels or it can transport water. It can contribute to the climate emergency and have violent ends or it can sustain life. So we can think about infrastructure um, upholding different ways of life as well. So I think about infrastructure um, for three major reasons. First, infrastructure underpins and shapes agriculture and what kind of agriculture is possible in the future. Second, infrastructures are mundane and they're taken, and grant, taken for granted until they're broken or disrupted. We see this with the Russian invasion. What seems so certain, Ukraine's position as a major agricultural exporter is now fractured and has become uncertain. So we see infrastructures emerge when they're broken. Third, infrastructure is a way to think of how humans and nature interact. It is built. So around agricultural infrastructures, we can think of uh, grain elevators, ports, railways. And importantly, all of this requires nature. Here, I'm thinking about how the infrastructure of ports brings together land and water. Or to grow a crop, we need an infrastructure of soil, of seeds, of water, and of course, humans all to bring that together. So infrastructures arrange the interaction between human lives with nature. Agriculture is a perfect example of nature, humans, and usually some sort of constructed infrastructure. And thinking about agricultural exports here, thinking about specifically grain exports that we're familiar with in Canada and we see in Ukraine, railways, grain storage, trucks, ports, the fuel required for machines. Or <laughs> we can examine the inputs required for planting fertilizing, caring for crops, or the feeding, watering, caring required for animals that come to our dinner plate. So a puzzle then, what infrastructure is required for an agricultural economy? And what kind of agricultural economy does it uphold? So, Let's take a look at Ukraine. How did we get here? How did Ukraine become such an important agricultural exporter? The Russian invasion illuminated the role of Ukraine in the global food system. Ukraine has emerged as a major agricultural commodity exporter. And I wonder it ex ex underscore exporter here because this is a change that has occurred over the last few decades from the Soviet to the post-Soviet independence of Ukraine. So a really quick overview of the transformation from Soviet to post-Soviet independence for Ukraine. The shifts through the 20th century are marked by political as well as infrastructural shifts in agriculture. We can think of the collectivization and the mechanization under Stalin, moving to Khrushchev, who brought the steps under cultivation, expanding agricultural cultivation to sort of marginal areas. And then after the breakup of the USSR in the late 1991, post-Soviet period led to a de-collectivization and privatized corporate farms. These are the same farms that were built up over the 20th century under Soviet leaders Stalin and Khrushchev. Um, this collectivization was then privatized. So we have the privatization of large tracts of land. And this was accompanied by the adoption and importation of Western agricultural technology. 
and a real shift in production to an export market, specifically a grain export market. So during the 1990s, immediately after the dissolution of the Soviet Union, there was actually a large decline in agricultural production, and it was worsened by poor weather. At the same time, we saw a shift in production in Ukraine, as well as Russia, actually. Um, grain production shifted from being um, supplying the domestic feed industry for livestock, and then it was, and in turn, it was directed towards an export market. So, what did this mean? Is uh, meat began to be imported, um, and grain began to be exported as feed grains were turned into export grains. So, um, I mentioned that there was this privatization of these large collectivized farms. And turning into the 2000s, corporate agri-holding increased. We started to see um, private corporations become a larger player, especially starting in 2005, we began to see an increase in investment along with a land rush. Now, this coincides with the global dynamics of what is called a commodity super cycle um, through uh, the mid 2000s and into 2007, 2008, we saw food prices because there was such a sharp increase in commodity prices, including agricultural commodity prices. And along with this, uh, we started to see an increase in land grabs. So there was an increase in interest um, in the large swaths of land in Ukraine. So the shift in ownership led to vertically integrated firms that developed not only primary agriculture, but also moved into processing and distribution. We're really familiar with that in Canada and North America, actually around the world these days, these vertically integrated firms. So this was um, all of these firms or primarily most of the firms, I should say, were really focused again on grain exports. So interest in Ukrainian production was further sparked by the rise in food prices that I mentioned. And we see what was called quote unquote, new operators, increased capital investments, imported technology from the West and the increased interest of transnational corporations, all focused on grain exports. At the same time, we see these new players with capital, these new privatized, large vertically integrated um, operations. The state was also supporting the export of grain and aimed to help manage grain purchases within Ukraine, but also strengthen the infrastructure for export. So interestingly, the ports and we know how important ports are in uh, the export of grain. Ports were set up to receive imports, not to facilitate exports. So we saw a shift in the ports infrastructure. Grain storage capacity shifted from supporting domestic consumption to um, domestic consumption around cities then we started to see grain storage really focused on the ports uh, to facilitate this export. So from 2001 into um, 2021, we saw the grain uh, capacity at ports in the Ukraine increase from 40 million tons to somewhere, to somewhere around 100 million tons in 2021, although, um, the estimates vary. So what does this mean? Over the last couple of decades, we have a grain import, a grain export infrastructure has been constructed that was structured through vertically integrated corporations with the use of high inputs and the adoption of Western agricultural technology. Resulting in what? Ukraine becoming a massive part of the global agricultural markets, which I'll detail in a moment. 
Now here, I'd like to turn to um, a bit more of a human side of Ukraine. So thinking about the Ukrainian context, obviously the invasion is an acute threat to the Ukrainian people on multiple scales. Um, but I'd like to highlight the fact that there's a high rate of food insecurity in Ukraine. Rural food providers, especially in poorer countries are often the hungriest. Um, and especially since 2019, there's been a huge uptick in food insecurity in Ukraine. In 2019, there were around 17% of women in the Ukraine were food insecure, and that leaped to 20, 29% in 2021, in just two years. We saw a similar leap, leap in food security for men, who went from around 13% of men in Ukraine were food insecure to in 2019. In 2021, it leaped up to 24%. So even before the invasion, there were really um, dire consequences for the people in Ukraine around food insecurity. Now, because Ukraine is so uh, focused on an agricultural economy, as you can see by this quote by President Zelensky, it is well recognized uh, the importance of agriculture. The quote is because it's about life, about our life, about our future. So after the invasion, we're starting to see some changes in agricultural policy because of the invasion. Um, plans are afoot to focus on food for Ukrainians rather than the export market. For example, Ukraine has limited exports of maize, oats, buckwheat, millet, sugar, and salt. And because labor is so important, uh, obviously, for agriculture, um, there's deferment uh, from conscription because of spring and summer field work. Farm workers um, uh, are not being conscripted because uh, planting and tending the fields is so important. So I wanna talk a bit about the timing right now. Uh, winter wheat is really important in Ukraine. And you can see uh, from this Financial Times infographic um, that land preparation uh, has to be occurring now or has had to occur. Uh, and that was completely disrupted uh, by the conflict. And there's uh, increasing threats to the planting uh, and growing as well as just the tending the fields. So exporting agricultural products takes large export infrastructure but it also takes an infrastructure at every field, field preparation, harvesting, planting, and so on, is really under threat because of this conflict. So this just came out from a, a really quite good article that came out yesterday from the Financial Times. After the invasion, um, these really important agricultural exports dropped off precipitously uh, from Ukraine. The agricultural infrastructure that was set up for export has now been broken. The conflict has closed major ports in Ukraine and severed logistics and transport links. The Russian Navy has prevented commercial shipping in the Black Sea from entering or departing key ports through which about 90% of Ukraine's agricultural goods are exported. So according to the London-based shipping tracker, when we're limited, there are around 200 maritime vessels, this was in March, were unable to depart uh, Ukrainian ports. So the conflict obviously has disrupted commercial transport of goods. And it's becoming hugely complicated to get any kind of commercial transport out. It's complicated by navigating sanctions, huge rise in insurance costs, and of course, freight costs. 
Um, the Russian army is also um, targeting agricultural infrastructures. For example, the Ukrainian trans agro grain terminal at the Maripol seaport was completely destroyed by Russian troops. There's reports of Ukraine include damage and looting of elevators. For example, they're taking the machinery out of the elevators uh, and looting as well as other supplies out of the grain elevators. Uh, yesterday, there was a report that Russian troops are shelling the railways. And why is this important? Um, because the ports were um, so important and there's a blockade, uh, there was some movement to move uh, exports to the railways, uh, and now those are being attacked. Um, initially, oil depots were targeted to destroy fuel, fuel supplies, but now the railway infrastructure is being targeted to stop the movement of goods uh, in both directions. Um, uh, another problem, if even if the railways weren't targeted by military strikes, there's an issue because the gauges, the railway gauges are different from uh, the Soviet railway gauges are a different size than the EU railway gauges. So once they even meet um, the EU, then everything has to be changed to either different railways or um, there's some kind of mechanisms to actually change the wheels themselves. So the Russian invasion is targeting transport distribution and agricultural sites. Um, just last week, the President Zelensky, um, actually earlier this month, Pre President Zelensky stated that the Russians are, quote, doing everything to ruin our agricultural potential and provoke a food crisis, not only in Ukraine, but in the world, saying troops have placed landmines and fields and farm equipment has been destroyed. So here um, are some pictures of some of the destruction. The first is um, a storage site for sunflowers that is on fire. The second is a transport logistics site that is obviously destroyed. Um, and then the third is an abandoned tank uh, in a field. So in addition to the field infrastructure, the planting, the disruption of planting and tending the fields and uh, potentially harvesting as well, in, as well as the destruction of the actual physical infrastructure, agricultural physical infrastructure that is required to export um, grains. Um, the logistics uh, is also disrupted. The large grain traders who operate in the area, the ABCDs, Archer Daniels Midland, Bungie, Cargill, Louis Dreyfus, as well as Kofco out of China. These uh, operations account for somewhere between 70 and 90% of global grain trade have reportedly closed down operations as well. So that's a bit of the Ukrainian grain export uh, infrastructure and how it has been compromised in a number of ways because of the Russian invasion. Now I'd like to turn to how it interacts with the global agricultural market infrastructure. Why is Ukraine so very important? So exports for all intents and purposes have stopped. And now we turn to part of the global agricultural trade infrastructure an important part has been broken and that's Ukrainian exports. Why? Because that domestic program that I mapped out has been remarkably successful. The focus on grain exports has been wildly successful. The grain exports were not only um, wildly successful, we now have a number of countries reliant on them. Together, uh, with Russia, Ukraine accounts for somewhere, the estimates obviously change because of production, somewhere between a third and a quarter of all uh, global wheat exports around the world. Ukraine is the sixth largest exporter of wheat. Um, they account for, they're the number seventh exporter of soy, 
They account for about 15% of maize exports around the world. And they're probably the largest exporter of sunflower, although it's hard to get exact figures. So what does this mean? It means the destinations um, are really important. Ukraine was fairly reasonably priced in its grain. And so a lot of countries in the Mideast and particularly Africa became highly dependent on grain imports from uh, Ukraine. So we have an infrastructure of agricultural exports, highly specialized. In this case, grain, it's led to a high, uh, a heavy reliance of food importing countries. The run-up of food prices that we're all familiar with, this will negatively affect the food security of the most vulnerable around the world. And this is um, particularly the food importing countries. So I want to just take a moment to talk about global food security and what was the context? What was the context of global food insecurity when the invasion happened? Even before the Russian invasion of Ukraine, global food security was in a severe situation due to the ongoing pandemic, due to climate change and biodiversity loss. The Ukraine conflict does not happen in a vacuum. We have new COVID variants. We have ongoing disruptions to supplies. We have a weak economic recovery. It's now complicated by rising inflation. All of these economic problems were borne by the poorest countries, including Ukraine, which is carrying a high rate of debt. This constrains countries' abilities to make domestic, um, make take on specific domestic policies that might support uh, their people. So this infrastructure of agricultural trade affects countries around the world. And it's estimated now that in 2020, there is somewhere between 700 and 800 million people in the world who faced hunger in um, who face were facing hunger the FAO estimates with this conflict that it's going to add somewhere between 8 to 13 million more people this is going to be about a 10 percent increase now who will be most affected by the crisis those countries that are both poor and dependent on imported grains so for example Egypt imports somewhere around 80% of all their wheat from Ukraine and Russia. If you recall, there was a severe um, rise in prices in 2008 and 2011. In 2011, you might recall, the Arab Spring was sparked by rising food prices. So one of the implications of the conflict is rising food prices into a context where there's high food insecurity, high food insecurity around countries that are poor and food importing and often reliant on Ukraine grain. The concern of protests, food protests that are coming out of a sharp rise in uh, food prices is the role of the state and the use of military force against protesters. What we've seen more recently is states are using more severe violence than they have in the past. So the rise in violence that states are using against citizens who um, have every right to protest is a real concern that comes along often with these food riots. Now, who are the countries that are going to be most affected? I mentioned um, the Middle East and certainly African countries as well. The poor food importing countries are going to be the most affected. But of course, this is going to impact vulnerable people both in developed and developing countries. When people are faced with rising prices, they'll have to cut other expenses, skip meals, um, and engage in other sort of strategies to sidestep uh, the rise in prices. The chief economist of the World Bank is warning, quote, there will be important ramifications in the Middle East 
for Africa in particular. So countries like Egypt that have a high import from Ukraine and Russia um, and a sharper rise than we saw in 2008. There's real concerns there. I also want to flag um, the people who are involved in um, trying to help folks who are hungry. So the World Food Program, Abir Atefa, the senior spokesperson for the Middle East and North Africa for the World Food Program stated, for some countries in the Middle East region, this conflict could drive millions of people into food poverty. And there's a real concern for the work that's done by the World Food Program because just as everyone else is affected by a rise in food prices, they too are affected by a rise in food prices as well as obtaining supplies. <clears throat> so there's a real concern around the conflict around global food security. Now, I wanna take a look at another aspect of of the crisis, and that's energy prices. Thinking about the fact, we've seen the sharp rise in food, but of course there's been a sharp rise in energy prices. Food and energy prices through um, market infrastructures are linked. And energy and food prices are tightly linked in three ways. First, the rise of energy costs increases the cost, especially of industrial food, industrial agriculture, which is highly dependent on energy intensive methods, obviously fuels for transport, the widespread use of agrochemicals, uh, the use of fertilizers are highly dependent on energy costs, and of course pesticides as well. These input costs are the sharpest rise um, recently since the Yom Kippur in 1973. So this is going to have ramifications around the world because these are global markets. Second, biofuels. Grains like wheat and corn and oil seeds like sunflowers are, are not just destined for our bellies, but they're used to produce ethanol and biodiesel. The demand for biofuels puts an upward pressure on prices, especially as oil and gas prices increase. Higher energy prices make more and larger quantities of agricultural feedstocks competitive for conversion into energy. And given the large size of the energy market, according to the FAO, this pulls food prices upward to a parity equivalent. So when we, after the last significant energy price hike in 2008, along with biofuel demand, this contributed to the food prices at the time. Third, the third connection between food and energy prices. Why are the prices going up so sharply and sometimes down so sharply? Food prices for major grains are determined on commodity exchanges and the price is determined for many commodities such as wheat, corn, and so on on the futures markets. This has global implications. Energy prices are often determined on futures markets as well through arbitrage, that is comparing different prices from around the globe, global investors calculate, invest, and speculate on futures prices. This means price, the prices we pay are partially shaped by financial actors and other investors who are speculating in futures markets. So investors and speculators also recognize the links between energy and food and act accordingly. Markets for commodities like metals, energy, other commodities often fall and rise in tandem 
When prices are on the rise, global commodity markets become targets for speculation, which can contribute to price rises, volatility, and unpredictable, spring, unpredictable swings. So we saw in January and February, even before the invasion, investors started piling into commodity markets. And this upended prices. We saw this pressure moving upwards at the time. So what happens is investors start moving into what are called commodity exchange traded products. These are um, special financial pro um, products that have a little bit of energy, a little bit of agriculture, but they're really focused, these particular ones, on commodities. And they benefit directly from rising energy and food prices. They have been in a huge demand at the beginning of this year, attracting almost $7 billion worth of new money globally. And that was just as the end, at the end of February. January and February saw around $7 billion, just under $7 billion pile into these um, commodity speculative tools or investment tools, depending on how you look at it. So we saw a marked rise in commodity investment from uh, 2021. Uh, and this is according to BlackRock, which is a large investment firm. So the G7 agricultural ministers um, in March reacted to this run up in food prices and energy prices and flagged speculation in food markets. Uh, and said that it can endanger food security. This is not something outside. This is something that is seen as a huge issue um, by agricultural ministers. They also recognized that food security was linked to climate and environmental commitments, and of course, the sustainable uh, development agenda. Sarah, so, just a time check. You've got yeah. ten, about 10 minutes. Perfect, thank you so much. So here I want to talk about, um, I want to turn back to one of the most important parts of an agricultural in infrastructure, and that's the environment. Of course, the immediate loss of lives, the destruction of food stores, uh, the intermediate issues such as the destruction of food and agricultural infrastructures that I touched on briefly, is a, these are crucial, no question. But the military itself and any military adventurism means environmental harm and environmental degradation at multiple scales. Military adventurism means massive greenhouse gas emissions. It means long-term issues of environmental degradation of fields, waterways, and forests due to toxic pollution from armaments, oil files, and other weapons. We don't know the full effect of military on climate change because governments actually aren't required to provide data on greenhouse gases being admitted by armed forces. But we can estimate that top military spenders like the US, like Russia, like China, are huge contributors. For example, um, Brown University's Cost of War project states that the US military by far was the largest single source of greenhouse gas emissions in the world. Obviously, Russia should be part of that accounting, especially with the invasion of Ukraine. Here, I want to be clear. Militarism is an infrastructure of death and destruction. The long-term environmental conflicts, the long-term environmental effects of conflict, toxicants in the soil, more acute issues such as leftover munitions in fields, as well as acute destruction of lives and the built infrastructure is a menace to agriculture. Agriculture is an infrastructure that sustains life. The invasion is contributing to both long and both long and short-term destruction with the loss of life, both human and non-human 
So to summarize, the kind of infrastructures we choose to support underpin and shape the agriculture and what kind of agriculture is possible in the future. We saw that with the shift in Ukraine from a domestic focus to an export focus. Second, infrastructures are mundane, taken for granted until it's broken or disrupted. We see that with the Russian invasion. What was certain with Ukrainian grain exports has now become uncertain. Third, infrastructure requires engagement of humans with nature and taking care of the environment is a central concern, central concern to protect agriculture into the future. Obviously, the Russian invasion is a huge threat to that. So reflections on possible steps forward, what to do. Agricultural exporters are highly specialized, and this leads to a high dependence on a few countries. The, FA, the FAO has called for diversification of food supply. I would also add a diversification of agriculture more broadly that includes a wide range of practices and foods, not solely from an industrial model that relies on a few key crops, intensive energy import, import, inputs, and a real sole focus on exports. The system is vulnerable because it is dependent and highly specialized. The infrastructure it relies on is intensive. It requires intensive inputs, especially energy related inputs. This means that it can also be contributing to climate change. And the biggest threat to agriculture is climate change. Second, Support vulnerable groups. High prices of food and energy are regressive on poor people, ideally with cash transfer programs and by expanding coverage of existing social protection programs or introducing new programs. There is a clear and sharp worrying increase in food insecurity. We know, and this links to the FAO recommendations, that supporting expanding a social safety net programs work. Third, regulate speculation on food commodities. After two decades of light touch regulation, we have seen an increase in volatility and unpredictable markets. Further regulation by states is imperative to rein in some of the speculative investment that is going on on food commodities that makes these markets very unpredictable. And that's it for me. I want to thank you for your attention and I'm most grateful for the time that we've spent together. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sarah. That was um, such an important presentation with uh, your research has thorough and you're going into uh, information that isn't available in any other way besides people like you who take take the time to do that research and and share it and we're really grateful for that so thanks thanks so much for for uh, your presentation today